Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. The world is tuned in to the Olympic Games in Tokyo, and today's guest will certainly spark some memories. Dominique Dawes is a three-time Olympic gymnast. In 1996, she helped Team USA, nicknamed the Magnificent Seven, to its first ever gold medal at the Summer Olympics in Atlanta. Dominique is the only American gymnast to medal in the team competition at three different Olympic Games, and she's the first African-American gymnast to win an Olympic gold medal, paving the way for so many, including future stars like Simone Biles and Jordan Childs. But as Dominique will share in our conversation, the success often came at a price. Now a big part of her story is helping to change the culture inside of the sport she loves. She opened the first Dominique Dawes Gymnastics and Ninja Academy in Maryland to inspire kids to create a supportive and empowering gym environment. A mom of four, she calls her children her greatest motivation. In today's conversation, we talk about finding your greater purpose and defining success in your own terms. Here we go. This is my conversation with Dominique Dawes. Well, Dominique, thank you for for coming on. I am uh, I'm honored. I'm excited. You know, we shared the stage at an event a couple years ago, and uh, I think I was more excited to meet you than the audience. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so this will be fun. Yeah, Dominique. You know, the world is tuned in to the Olympics right now. You know, you competed in three different Olympic games, which which is incredibly rare for any athlete, but especially a gymnast. Can you describe what it's like to train your entire career for such a short moment, for such a, some level, sort of fleeting moment? Well, I will say right now at 44, it seems as if those 18 years flew by. But when I was living it as a young child from age six to nearly 24, uh, when I hung up the leotard in the sport, those days were extremely long. Um, Yeah, I mean, most gymnasts are committing, especially if they're at the elite level, 32 to 36 plus hours a week in the gym. And they're usually waking up first thing in the morning to train in the morning for a few hours. I went to public school and then I would go back to the gym for five more additional hours at night and even train another five hours on the weekend. I truly did have a deep love for the sport of gymnastics. It's all that I knew from ages six on and felt as if my personality, my body type, my skill set um, you know, really fit into that gymnastics environment. But I must say now at 44 years old, a mother of four kids, twins like you, you know, there's things about the sport of gymnastics that do truly need to change. And that's what I'm committed to these days by opening my first of many gymnastics academies here in the state of Maryland. I'm all about ensuring that young girls that are in the sport of gymnastics have a very healthy and empowering experience and that it's not full of a lot of the abuses that still go the sport. And I want to dig into that. You know, I'm curious, what were the keys to you being able to sustain that success, right? To sustain that success over time? Because at some level, right, it's not just about getting there. It's about staying there. And you stayed there. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. There was a, I guess it was a documentary or some piece on HBO that came out some time ago. um, And it was primarily headlined by Michael Phelps. And it was talking about Olympians and you know, certain um, mental disorders and depression and things that he went through, you know, and then I think they interviewed a number of other Olympians. And I must say, part of my commitment to the sport of gymnastics, yes, I always talk about the deep love that I had for the sport, but there is a bit of an identity crisis that many elite level gymnasts struggle with that you really just see yourself as a gymnast and you really picture yourself doing anything else. And so you kind of develop this level of passion, but almost a a level of obsession that this is all that you can see yourself doing because that's all you've done for such a young age. And so part of me 
I do feel as if the reason why I stayed in the sport of gymnastics uh, was a fear of the unknown and feeling if, if this is what I'm good at, I'm just going to stick with this because I don't know if I'm capable of doing much else, uh, which really is a lack of confidence and also that lack of exposure to anything else because gymnastics is all that I did as a young person. To be a competitive gymnast for 18 years, you know, is it's a long time. And I, I saw my clients as an agent Often it was hard, and you just alluded to this, right, to be able to separate your identity, like who you are away from what you do, away from that sort of name on the back of the jersey and that sport that you compete in. How was your transition after you retired, after you stepped away? How did you create that separation, if you will, to know that there's a Dominique right? That isn't just the Dominique that was the Olympic gymnast. There's a person in there too. Well, I tried to transition, I would say, after the sport, after my second Olympic Games in Atlanta, Georgia in 1996. I really felt as if, you know, I'm a professional athlete. I'm doing personal appearances. I'm doing Broadway. I did some TV. I did some commentating. um, A great deal of, um, you know, kind of exploring, you know, so to speak, and seeing what else is it that I'm good at or passionate about. And I really always felt gravitated back to the sport because that was really what my identity was locked up in. And after my third Olympic Games, I was 23 years old, finally retired just around the age of 24. I realized I don't want to put a leotard on. I can't do this physically nor emotionally anymore. And it's time for me to get out there and find my next passion in life. And it was it was challenging. I went through some dark periods because you go through a, a bit of depression because you're losing part of yourself and the public defined you as as an Olympian, as a gymnast. Um, but it, it took some soul searching. And I realized I, I love the motivational speaking because I loved the idea of planting and, you know, this planting a seed in someone else's life. And that's a legacy that can continue to go on now as a mom of four kids. It's definitely being a mom. And then secondary, it's being this business owner of a gym that's more than just sports. It's really about building a community. It's really about planting a seed and making sure kids grow up to be happy, healthy kids and not just focusing on getting them on a podium. And you talked about Atlanta and you talked about 96. You know, everyone remembers, right, the Magnificent Seven, you know, the 96 gold medal team that you obviously were a part of in Atlanta. What do you remember most, Dominique, about those games? Oh, there was so much that was going on. I mean, I'm not going to say it was a blur, but it was just, you know, I think I just remember the enormous amount of pressure. And I will say that my other six teammates probably felt it as well, that there was a great deal of weight on these teenage shoulders of all of ours um, to make history, to, you know, win, to be on top of that podium. You know, we had the talent, the physical talent. We needed a little bit of luck. We needed the support of the fans and we got all that. And so that pressure was enormous. And I've never felt that again. Look forward to never feeling that <laughs> level of pressure again as well. And gymnastics, right? You're, you're always striving to score a perfect 10. You know, you're being judged somewhat subjectively, right, at some level by, by a panel. H- how do you blur that line between that perfectionism and, and sort of fearlessness that that sport requires? Yeah, the the sport does require you to strive for perfection. I mean, everyone remembers 1976, Nadia Komenich scoring that perfect. And and back then when I competed, that was the cap. That was the pinnacle. I mean, it's changed today because of the scoring system changing and and kids today getting a little bit more credit or value for doing more high risk skills, which I think is phenomenal and it's great for the sport. Uh, But doing my, during my era, you just knew you were under a microscope and you were constantly being judged. And it is very much a subjective, very much a political sport. And what one judge might find to be beautiful and want to give you credit for another judge may find that to be sloppy and deduct you for it. And so you really kind of felt this yo-yo of pleasing people where you, you know, someone loved something, someone else didn't like it. So it depended on, you know, who, who was going to be judging you that day was going to almost dictate what the final outcome was going to be, which is very tough as a young person to know you don't have very much control over your destiny. You know, and it's funny, right? Because we see some of this in real life, don't we? (laughs) And, And, and so how do you translate that? Like what, what did sort of that level of perfectionism, fearlessness, judgment, if you will, pleasing, how does that show up in the way that you live your life now? 
You know, it makes you, and I've rewired myself and I have to always myself because that was the culture that I came from. It was all about perfection. It was all about pressure. It's all about fear. It's all about silence. It's all about control. Uh, For young gymnasts in the sport, especially the elite level training, you're really taught to not trust your own feelings of how you're feeling or how you're being treated and that you should speak up. There is a great deal of silence and it does uh, take a toll on you. And I know as a young adult, even at times today as a 44 year old woman, nothing is ever good enough. But when I recognize that about myself where I'm thinking I need to correct things or change things all the time. I many times have to take a step back, take a breather and recognize, hey, that's the old culture. That's the old way that I was taught by the environment that I was in. And there's a better way of looking at life and to try to find those things in life that are worth celebrating, that are worth embracing and recognizing that there are going to be mistakes or slip ups, that we're all human, um, but we don't need to stay fixated on those things, which is what the sport does teach you to do. Sure. No question. I mean, I think our world today requires, you know, requires so much resiliency um, and, and our ability to recover from from tough moments. And, and to me, it's, it's a dangerous thing chasing perfection in life in general, right? <laughs> Certainly it serves you well as a gymnast at some level, right? But, you know, it, there's so much physical preparation clearly that goes into what you, you did. How did you navigate the mental preparation for the big moments, right? I mean, when I think about in, in life, you know, business people, people have big moments in their own lives where they feel intense pressure too. It's different. How did you do it? As a young teenager? Sure. And and even maybe now as you translated it into today, into different kinds of pressure in your life, how do you prepare for it? What is, you know, the things that you tell yourself inside of these big moments in order to deliver, in order to execute, which you clearly know how to do? Well, I think today as, you know, that my life is so much more fulfilling and meaningful where it's not just about me, my and I'm being married and having four children, you know, no two days are alike because, you know, being a parent, you're going to have so many different things thrown at you um, that you really can't be prepared for. There is no manual on how to best raise, you know, your children. And I think for today, when I'm dealing with pressure, you know, um, it's trying to remind myself to put things in perspective and to recognize what's most important. And I think that's what COVID did for a lot of us where everything shut down in the world and we recognize that, oh my goodness, we can now spend more quality time with our loved ones. We can listen to our children. We can recognize what our, our spouse may need. We can just sit back and we can breathe. And I think for me, it's recognizing I do have these high level of standards and that's helped me become to become successful in my athletic career. Um, but I need to make sure I manage and table that when it needs to be tabled and really focus on what's most important, even like with my business, like as much as I'd love to, and I do at times nitpick about things or we need to stay on top of things, really what's my why, what's my reasoning of doing it. And it's to make sure that each and every kid that walks through our doors has a positive, fruitful experience and that we as role models for these young kids are helping build them and shape them to be happy and healthy kids. When I remember that, I don't stress over a spill on the floor or a slip up by a staff member or me making mistakes. And then I look over at that kid that's smiling and meeting a new friend or running over to the coach to give them a big hug. And I'm like, that's why we're doing this, creating those amazing lasting memories, not about these little things that, yeah, we're human, we're going to make mistakes, we're going to have high standards. But at the end of the day, it's really about touching the lives of each of each and every one of these young people. There's a big difference between achievement and fulfillment. I always say, right, in navigating back to your why when we have to recover from adversity, to me, is so key, right? Keeping that why, what you're chasing really, right, front and center. You, um, After having the opportunity to spend time with you personally, I know that's near and dear to the way you operate, which is beyond belief cool. And so, so important, such a great lesson for all of us. You know, it, what I think so interesting, right, Dominique, I mean, gymnastics, it's such a unique sport in the sense that you're your fierce competitors, right, with your teammates. Yeah. I mean, you're sort of vying to make a team. So <laughs> yeah, and yeah. get a spot, right, and all of that stuff. It's, it's an individual sport, but then you also compete and come together as a team, right? And I think we see this in life, right, from time to time. 
how, how does that all play out? And, and how did it maybe, you know, as you think about the 96 Olympics and, and, the, and the gold medal team? How, tell me, get me inside of that a little bit. You know what would probably help the, the sport of gymnastics if it was really team focused only? And that's the thing, right? That our teammates are our competitors 99.5% of the time. You know, when you're training in practice, there's someone else training with you vying for that same spot and that's your best friend or, you know, your teammate that comes from that same gym that you're training at. And so that's what makes it very challenging in the sport that you are mainly focused. It's an individual sport where you're mainly focused on your own personal goals. And then there's this small amount of time where your, your individual score matters when it's uh, calculated with your teammates. And that was like the Olympics. That was world championships. Um, but it's very rare moments. Um, I just remember in 1996, the reason why that we, why we won gold and we were able to make history um, was because we really did put our egos aside. In practice, we weren't just focused on ourselves and our individual training but we would look over and we would cheer each other on. We would give someone a, a pat on the back. We would, you know, help pick someone up when they were having a tough practice. And those things, I think, really showed on the floor of the Georgia Dome, which is where it allowed us to make history. But it all happened behind the scenes, you know, in practice, when you normally are just focused on yourself, we were actually looking over and seeing our competitor as a teammate, which was important. But a big shift, right? But a powerful shift. And how, what a rewarding shift <laughs> to have made. It's awesome. Yeah, well, and that's the thing. I think that's what helps make teams more impactful. It, that's what helps, I guess, you know, the dream work with the team is you putting egos aside. I mean, you're a businesswoman. Um, those things are important to recognize that you don't have the answers to everything. I recognize I don't have the answers to everything. And every now and then I need to lean on you know, my counterparts, my teammates, and I'll be able to fulfill and accomplish so much more. You know, you you recently produced a docu-series called Golden, which which follows, you know, five top-tier gymnasts trying to make the Olympic team. You know, reflecting on your own experience, what does it take, right? I mean, what does it take? If you had to think of the two to three things, what does it take to compete at that level? Oh, I mean, it's been stressful for me watching it. I bet. (laughs) I mean, I, and I've, I've been quoted in saying that the level of anxiety that I have watching this docuseries <laughs> almost equates to the anxiety I used to feel um, preparing for the Olympic Games because I know what these young girls are going through. And I know the almost the lack of control that they feel like they have and knowing that there is a selection committee and that their efforts aren't the only thing that matters, that you do need um, a little luck on your side and that it is political. And that's what's so, you know, un fortunate about the sport of gymnastics. Um, But watching it has been challenging. There's five girls that we followed, like you said, and actually two of them, which is a huge percentage, two of them actually make this Olympic squad. And I'm elated for those two. And for the other three that don't make it, I am very heartbroken because, you know, I know that they've sacrificed and dedicated so much time, energy, blood, sweat, and tears to get this chance at making an Olympic squad. And they just fell um, just slightly short in some of it by no fault of their own. Um, but this was a wonderful docuseries to be a part of. I was elated when LeBron James's company approached me, Spring Hill, to be the executive producer. Uh, why? Because number one, he's the greatest athlete in the world. But number two, his company is all about athlete empowerment. And I would not have been involved in a project that really wasn't allowing the athletes to have a voice and to be transparent. And that's something that in the sport of gymnastics has lacked for many, many decades, the trans, the factor of transparency. And the Federation uh, opened the doors and allowed us to see some of the selection committee process, even interviewing the director of sports performance and allowing the young girls to be miked. And these young girls uh, we're pretty honest. We're very candid. And this was foreign for me to see coming from an era that I came from in the 90s where we were silenced. And we knew if we spoke up, because I did once, you know, you were going to get backlash and it was going to impact you in a negative way. And so it was very refreshing to be a part of this project, but it did bring back a great deal of anxiety. You know, you started gymnastics at six, right? And you talked about how physically you felt like, you know, this is this is my thing, right? I'm good at this physically, mentally, emotionally. I think I'm dialed in to have success here. Where do you think the drive also came from? Where'd that come from? 
you know, I think the drive came from a home life that lacked a great deal of compassion, of love, of consideration. I tell my husband all the time, if I came from a loving family, I can tell you what I wouldn't have done. I wouldn't have gone <laughs> to the Olympic Games. And so, yeah, I mean, I would have had a home life. Parents were there to embrace me. And, you know, I wouldn't have committed 36 plus hours in the gym, uh, literally breaking child labor laws. I mean, I would have been home with my family, which is what you know, I want for my four kids, while I want them to be challenged and, you know, to the, to be the best that they can be in the sports world when they play sports and academics as well, I do want them to have a balanced childhood. That's really what helps them to be happy, whole adults someday. So what drove me was I saw gymnastics as an outlet for me um, to go off to college, hopefully to earn a college scholarship, to, you know, find my passions and talents in this world, to meet new friends, to meet new families. Um, And it, in some capacity, definitely did that for me. And I think that drive did come from uh, the home life that I was was born in. Were there ever points, Dominique, during the journey for you that you wanted to quit? And and what, what kept you going? You know, I wanted to quit almost every single week in the sport of gymnastics. And I know when I was interviewed and I was young, I was like, I never want to quit. It's what <laughs> I'm doing. You always answer things where you're very politically correct, um, you know, because I knew you couldn't say that and not feel the ramifications when you went back to practice. But I wanted to quit all the time. It's It takes a toll on you physically. It takes a toll on you mentally. It takes a toll on you emotionally. It takes a toll on you socially. You become very... Um, almost one dimensional where again we spoke about earlier that identity crisis where you only see yourself as a gymnast you don't think you can do you know much else and um, that's something that I think you know I hope parents are a little bit more cognizant of with their young kids you know that it's important to have them in multiple sports have them in multiple activities um, you know so they can develop new friendships develop new skill sets and so that If they're only doing one thing, when that one thing is taking a toll on them, you know, it'll it'll be a very tough time for them. And I know for me, when when gymnastics was a bit of a struggle, I remember it really uh, taking a toll on me. But if I had a little bit more balance in my life, I probably wouldn't have it wouldn't have hit me and hurt me that much. What kept you going? Was it was it the long term vision of a better life, of a different life? Was it being being at the gym was better than being at home? Is I mean, was it at the core? Was it that? No, my fans. I would say my fans did play a huge role. Knowing that I had the ability to impact someone else's life, you know, really was something that mattered to me. And I recognized that at a, at a young age when I started getting fan mail letters. Like back in the day, Molly, they would fans would sit down, handwrite letters, <laughs> sure. and send their school photos to me, and I would send my school photos signed back to them. And so that really drove me as well, knowing that I had the capability of impacting someone else's life for the better, that I could get a young girl or a young boy or a grandma or a grandpa, you know, I could plant these amazing memories in their lives, or I could plant an amazing seed in someone else's life to help them recognize that they too could strive for an Olympics or be great at something. And that's why I truly am humbled and blessed to know that you know, athletes such as Simone Biles or even Jordan Childs, when I met her when she was super, super young, um, you know, looked up to me in some capacity or knew, knew something about my journey and, and inspired them. That is, that's truly a gift to know that you can change someone else's life in a positive way. And that, that really is what drove me. And that's really what helped me come back, um, as well for my final Olympic Games, other than the fact that I was like, I don't know what else I can do, (laughs) Um, you know? Sure, um, sure. the impact on the fans. And that's even much of my motivation today is that legacy. And that's something that my husband was like, you need to do this. This is about you giving back to your fans, you giving back to the community. And that makes all the bumps and hardships in the road we're gonna face and we have faced um, all worth it. In just a minute, we'll get back to the conversation. But first, I want to share a free resource for you. Through this podcast, I've had the opportunity to connect with more than 100 leaders, championship coaches, elite athletes, business leaders, and thought leaders. I've learned so many valuable insights from these conversations that I decided to distill it down into seven mindset shifts that can help you, that can help you reimagine your role as a leader. 
You'll also get a playbook with exercises to help you put these principles into action. To get your free, to get your free playbook, just go to mollyfletcher.com backslash mindset shifts. Again, that's mollyfletcher.com backslash mindset shifts. Now back to the show. You know, you are so humble. You, you were the first black woman to win a gold medal at the Olympics in gymnastics. What does it mean to you now seeing stars? You know, you mentioned this, Simone Biles, whose path you helped pave, right? At what point did you fully realize the impact that you had made? You know, I remember in 1992 at the Olympic trials in Baltimore being the first female African-American to rightfully qualify to the Olympic Games in my hometown. That was truly an honor. And I remember feeling the love of the fans in the stands um, and looking over at the faces of other little young African-American girls and boys uh, there, you know, in tears, their grandmothers in tears, their moms in tears, their dads just, you know, cheering me on and recognizing, wow, you know, I am opening the doors, you know, for young kids that maybe never saw themselves in this sport. And it was truly a blessing and an honor. Um, I don't think I recognized the impact until I will, I've said this before, until, you know, Halle Berry won um, an Oscar um, because I remember being home. I was a young adult at the time. And when she won, and I think, I believe she should have won for another movie, but when she won, I was in tears because I was like, oh, wow, I can think and I can put myself in the shoes of another young person um, now believing that they too can succeed down this road in the arts because of what they've seen her accomplish. And then it, a light bulb went on and I'm like, wow, this is what many moms and grandparents have been telling me for years and years of uh, the impact and the joy that I gave them. And so it does still humble me because I, I'm just baffled that people even know my accomplishments or will know my name or things of that nature, or even families that we have a part of our facility now that have relocated to have their kids come here. And I don't even have a competitive team. And they were like, no, we're, we want our children under, you know, your program, your culture, your philosophy, because of what you did for them and the years of you know, um, joy I gave them. But it's, it's an honor, but I will say each and every time it, it just surprises me. Um, you know, cause I was just, I truly feel I was just pursuing, pursuing my passion and just wanting to make a difference. You talk about the need now and the changes, the changes that you're making in your own gym and, and the way that children are experiencing the sport of gymnastics. But you even talked about it at a more holistic level, right, in life and parents and the way that parents can think about this and that your goal, right, is this whole person that is developed through their journey of sport, whatever that might be. When you think about you, when you think about Dominique, if you could go back and do it all over again, would you change anything? You know, I would keep the same pain that I had in my life that I had no control over because it's put me to where I am at today and it's helped me develop the passion that I have for what I'm doing today. And while I don't want that be, I don't want any young person to be inflicted, that inflicted upon them, you know, because the culture is a pretty crummy culture in many cases. I don't want that for any other kid, but I truly do believe that pain does serve a greater purpose in life. And that's why I am so driven to be a part of this change. That is why um, I believe I care so much. That is, I believe why I'm so passionate because of the experiences that I have had and even the experiences that I witnessed teammates have and even the experiences that others have come up to me and either written me an email or handwritten me a letter or told me in person today of what's been going on and continues to go on in a number of gyms. Even a very positive coach brought to my attention that he witnessed a young girl dragged off a balance beam by her hair and then dragged across the floor mat. What is a, an alarm for me is how can you stand there and witness that and not do something about it? And that's the thing. We need these positive coaches that know better, that are not abusive to speak out and to be vocal. And I think the thing is, in the sport of gymnastics, there is so much fear instilled in not only these young girls, but even their parents and even the other coaches 
that the silence truly does continue. If you saw the documentary Athlete A, you see one of the parents talk about her knowing her daughter was abused. She bringing it up to the the powers that be, and they told her, don't worry about it. We'll handle it. And she was silenced because she was afraid to speak up because of the fact that her speaking up was going to jeopardize her child's chances of making that Olympic team. They then subsequently left her off the Olympic team anyway. My thing is this, we need to do what's right and we need to speak up, even when it may be hard to do, even when you feel as if you may be or your child may be uh, put under a microscope or scrutinized or, um, you know, their whatever is jeopardized. You've got to do what's right. It's the tough thing, but it's the right thing to do. And that's what needs to be changed about the sport of gymnastics, because these level of abuses, verbal, physical, emotional, psychological, and sexual, sadly, still do persist. And it's affecting these young people for the rest of their lives. You know, and as we all get ready to dial in and watch these remarkably special moments, these incredibly gifted, hardworking, committed athletes, you know, it makes me think of I was watching um, the Way to the Gold on a Flight recently, a documentary that sort of explores the mental health challenges of Olympic athletes. I mean, is this, w- what can we as people who watch these moments, right, at some level, it, what can we do uh, on our end, right? I mean, we enjoy the moments, but at the same time, it's hard to enjoy it if you feel like they're, they're, there's pain on the other side of that screen, if you will. Well, number one, it's the parent's responsibility. Whenever I see... Um, a young girl looks sad, you know, and she's crying walking into a gym and she's crying leaving a gym. And the parent is sitting there in the waiting room, afraid to speak out, afraid to use their voice. That's a problem. You know, it is our job as parents to protect and nurture our children. It is our job as parents to know those that are influencing and impacting our children. It's not worth the level of abuse. It's not worth, you know, the stripping of your child's joy and happiness to get a slim chance of getting on an Olympic team. And it's it's just sad to think that for myself, even in my best friend, we used to, for years, almost, it was comical that her parents would get kicked out of the waiting room her kick, her parent would get kicked out of the waiting room all the time. And she would be in practice crying. I'd be crying for some reason as well. And we thought it was kind of comical. But now that we are mothers, I'm a mother of four. Here, she's a mother of three. We now are like, oh, wait, if that ever happened to me and I was trying to protect my child, you know what I would do? If I'm going to get kicked out of the waiting room for protecting my child or speaking up, I'm actually going to take my child and take our business elsewhere. And it's interesting, that's just how things were and kind of are where parents do sit in the waiting room and they're afraid to speak up or they're afraid to cross a line because then they know, um, you know, it would affect their their child's chances or what have you or jeopardize, um, you know, the chances of them getting selected for a certain team. That, That to me as a parent is absurd, absurd. It is my job, again, to protect and nurture my child. And it starts in all environments that I put my kid in. Well, at some level, right, it's playing the long game, isn't it, right? I mean, it's the, it's the adult that you're, in turn, uh, raising, right? We, we raise adults. <laughs> we say we raise kids, but we raise adults, kids to become adults. And so... Well, that's a very good point that you're making. And my husband was a school teacher for 18 years. And he said he used to always tell parents don't care of what your kids think of you when they're 12 years old, when you're protecting them. Care about what your, what your kids think about them, care about you when they're 32 years old. And my thing is those parents that try to intervene and, you know, protect their children. Yes, their children at 12 will be upset, will be embarrassed, will be mad at mom or dad kicking and screaming that you maybe have taken them out of an unhealthy environment. But when they're 30 years old and they're a happy whole adult, They'll be thanking you that you took them out of that abusive, dysfunctional environment 
that has broken and beat down many young girls. Well, and you're, you know, you're putting your your words into action, right? Tell us about your gymnastics and ninja academy, right? Which I love that, by the I way. Know, right? <laughs> right on, girl. What inspired you? I mean, you talked about it a little bit, but I mean, I, and I think when we were actually together, it was literally sort of opening. Tell me a little bit about it and, and, and kind of get us inside of that at some level. How many kids are you serving? And the ninja piece, I, I got to understand. <laughs> yeah, it's super fun. I mean, the, it's the Dominique Dawes Gymnastics and Ninja Academy. Our first location is in Clarksburg, Maryland. It's in the county that I grew up in, and we want to do multiple locations. And very much the motivation behind this is to create a healthy, empowering, and encouraging environment for young gymnasts and ninjas. It is not just about sport. It is about developing the whole child, physical health, emotional health, social health, um, you know, psychological health, you name it. It's about building a healthy community. I am so sick and tired of hearing former gymnasts, even myself, um, you know, talk about the level of anxiety that we went through. And even today as an adult, when you drive by the gym that you used to train at, you feel the anxiety that you have to go a different direction. That's problematic. We want to create a healthy community that kids that are a part of this know that they're loved, know that they're cared for. And it really starts with hiring the right team of people. It's about hiring people that have a passion for working with kids that are happy people, happy people, whole people themselves, not one dimensional and miserable people, but people that when they see a kid, they want to connect with the kid and they recognize that their words, their actions and their inactions matter and can leave a lifelong impact upon a kid. It is not about getting kids to the top of a podium. It is more part, more important about developing those happy whole adults someday. That's what matters more to me than anything. I don't need an Olympic gold medalist. We don't need an Olympian. We don't need a champion athlete. It really is about developing these champion kids in life. And the ninja component came about, unfortunately, because male men's gymnastics has not been on the rise. And I love, love ninja. And there's so many great um attributes in ninja that really translate very well in gymnastics, the strength, the coordination, the balance, the conditioning, the upper body strength that's needed. Our gymnasts are rock stars in ninja and our ninjas are rock stars in gymnastics. And ninja is great because it's even for those multi-sport athletes. We have some baseball players, some wrestlers, football players, basketball players up here and take these fun ninja classes that are kicking their butt because it it's is awesome. It's challenging. It's yeah, challenging. I bet. More importantly, more importantly, it's fun and they're building friendship. You know, for sure. That's what it's for. You know, running a business is it's a lot of work. You know, what's the entrepreneurial journey been like for you? You know, what have you learned maybe about yourself through the process? You know, I learned and I've, you know, come from an individual sport and you know, we had moments where you work with the team and you recognize you can't do it alone. Um, I am not trying to be superwoman. You will not see me really on the floor coaching. Um, I say this all the time that I'm not going to lose my family. I'm not going to get a divorce over this business. And I'm not going to um, have four children that don't know me as mom and that I'm only the businesswoman or a coach on the floor. And so I recognize the importance of needing to delegate and to, to recognize that I'm not going to spread myself thin. My priorities truly are my faith. My husband that he, but he tells me all the time, he's like, there's no way I'm second. He's like, I never <laughs> second at all. And then it's my kids. Um, and then it's the business and the community and the impact that we can make. Because um, at the end of the day, I truly do know when I'm on my deathbed, if I'm ever blessed to be on my deathbed and have an opportunity to connect with people, the people that I'm going to want there by my side are my husband and my kids. And I want to make sure that while I'm here on earth and healthy and, and, and such that I'm spending quality time with them. And I would not be doing this business if my husband wasn't as, as involved as he is. This is a family affair. And I wouldn't be doing this business if this isn't a business that my four kids couldn't come to. Um, my two daughters right now are in um, summer camp. My twins are home and they'll be here tomorrow. It's a family affair. And I love the fact that, you know, we're doing this together because uh, it's it's truly a lot of work. <laughs> well, it is. I'm sure it is. I mean, it, but what is so cool, right? I think sometimes people think that if you're going to have great success, that you can't have fulfillment. And I think where you've navigated to in your life, there's room for both. 
And I think in life with most people, there's room for both. We can have tremendous success, but we can also stay connected with our family, with our faith, with our children, uh, and it, with the people in our lives that matter most and the values in our lives that matter most. Yeah. And Molly, you know what? For me, that is success. Yeah. Amen, girl. Yep. We've made money. We've left an impact, which is great. But for me, success truly is first and foremost, my home life. And many times I realize when the business is doing well, I've made too much of a sacrifice at home that I need to step back at home a little bit more. And so it's it really is about this crazy balancing act, but also making sure that your priorities are right. And that's where I'm, I recognize I'm not Wonder Woman. I can't do it alone. If I feel spread thin, then I need to hire someone else, you know, because I don't want to take time away from, you know, my four kids or time away from my husband. He always asks for time. And it's that day when he's not asking for time that I should be worried. And so <laughs> if, right. you know, if on another salary, then so be it, because I don't, want to I learned I learned coming from a certain household where the idea of marriage was what I was like I'm never getting married if that's the definition of married and so I've realized at 44 you can define what marriage is you can define what motherhood is and what I grew up in I don't want any of that and it's up to me to define what do I want this marriage to look like and what do I want my relationship with my three girls and my son to look like. And, you know, you got to recognize there's only 24 hours in a day. And so being an entrepreneur, which is more important, your family life or, you know, being this entrepreneur and being known by the world. And for me, it's all, it's truly the priority really is family. Well, it's funny that you say that, you know, I played tennis in college and my daughter, our oldest daughter played tennis and she said, and people would always say, well, do you coach her? And I said, you know what? There's a lot of people that can coach her. There's only one person that can be your mom. So I'm yeah. choosing oh, the I mom lane. <laughs> yep. Yep. So Dominique, we end with rapid fire. I'm going to hit you with a few quick ones and you just fire back. Sound good? Sounds good. One word to describe yourself. I would just say passionate. One word others would use to describe you. I would say, and I guess I guess, I guess it's because I've heard it, but humble. Mm, love it. Introvert or extrovert? Very introverted. <laughs> An Olympian you are most excited to watch compete this Olympics? Uh, you know, Jordan Childs, because I know about her journey. One thing you are grateful for right now? One thing that I'm grateful for right now, and this really just like, encompasses throughout all the years, honestly, all my pain. Mm, wow. Even my miscarriage, it's all made me a better person in life. All of it. What are you reading, watching, or listening to right now? Oh, I wish I had time to read. Um, <laughs> yes, goodness. What am I reading? I need to be reading the Bible more. Um, I am, yeah, always watching my kids. I know you're talking about TV. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. I understand. I hear you. Yeah, I probably need a life outside of these few things that I've talked about. <laughs> So the the show's called Game Changers. So one last question. What Game Changer inspires you and why? You know, not that I'm not motivated and inspired by people, but I will say certain people have taught me what not to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's good. I learned. You know, you want to learn from good and you want to learn from not good. Um, you know, I would say, yeah, I don't know. I mean, for some reason, Game Changer is just really developing the patience of Job. So knowing Job's story makes me, you know, that's a game changer. I need patience as we all do in sure, life. Sure. And your husband. I mean, we can throw your husband in there just in case he listens. You know, it's funny. I really <laughs> love it. And then I'm like, I don't want to hold up on this, hold him up on this pedestal. But then the thing is, when people meet him, he is so much more lovable than me. Um, and he gets me out of my comfort zone and out of the shell and the walls that I've built around me because of a lot of pain in life. And so, um, yeah, he would be a game changer, but we want to make sure other people don't. We want to make sure he doesn't know that. <laughs> Keep him humble like you. Dominique, yes. you are awesome. It was so fun to spend time with you backstage. And then now again, so thank you for, for being you. You're awesome. Thank you, Molly, for your time. I do appreciate it. Number one, what you do isn't who you are. This one is so important. Dominique was absolutely a competitive gymnast for 18 years, starting at age six. 
She was open about the identity crisis that comes with your sense of self being so tied up in what you do. I saw this often as an agent. It's so important for all of us. Never let what you do define who you are as a person. You're so much more than that. Number two, turn your pain into purpose. Dominique talked about how going through tough times has made her a better person. In fact, it was interesting when I asked her what she was most grateful for. She said her pain. Wow. It was a great reminder how life's challenges can unlock our greater purpose. Number three, find success on your own terms. The outside world might define her success in terms of gold medals. But for Dominique, that didn't bring fulfillment. Big difference between success and fulfillment. She has been intentional about creating success on her own terms. Thanks, as always, for listening to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. There you can listen to previous episodes and leave us a review, which helps other people find out about the show. This episode was edited and sound designed by the team at Sound On Studios. You can find out more about their work at soundonsoundoff.com. Check it out. For more about me, visit mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be bold.